We're here with the homeless hero and I'm so glad he made time to talk to me. He does not want to be seen on camera, so we're going to ask him about it and he has a lot of good things to say. Okay. All right. Hi, homeless hero. Hey, hey, how you doing? How's everything? Uh, great. So I wanted to ask you a few things. Uh, about your background, uh, uh, about your background, can you tell me something about yourself? Well, like um, as a child, where were you born? Well, I'm from New York City, uh, born and raised, and um, you know I have, a, in my opinion, a rich history. Uh, been around a long time, and and I'm I'm here, you know. So you're from uh, uptown. Yes, I'm from the Bronx. From the Bronx. Yeah. And how long have you been homeless? Um, right now, I've been um, in the shelter system for maybe like a year. Okay. And you were one of the residents who moved to the Lucerne? Yes. Yes. Great. Uh, why do you want to be anonymous? Well, um, in this role as um, the homeless hero and advocating for myself and other homeless people or other people that are uh, dealing with homelessness and those of us that's in the shelter system. I believe that it's important for me to reflect, um, to, to basically speak, not just for myself, but to speak for people that may can't speak for themselves. So rather than have the attention focus on me, I'd rather it to focus on you know the issues that we that we deal with and anything that can be done to help us in a in a better way then you know that's where the focus should be not on me as an individual because i'm really no different than anybody else that's struggling with homelessness so how can we as a community help you guys for example well and i know that that was a question for the end but. yeah it's okay <laughs> um well there's a number of things that that can be done i mean um you know, um, because we're in a new community and, you know, uh, things have been a little tense um, from the community standpoint, from the resident standpoint, and, and of course the service providers, the shelter, et cetera. You know, I think the real, the first and foremost, we have to alleviate that tension, you know. So there, that re involves a conversation that has to include everybody. You know, which I know that as of this, you know, us speaking, um, there's been several community meetings, virtual community meetings, and um, uh, Project Renewal, the shelter overseeing the, uh, the us at the Lucerne, they've done some, some new things to try and um, facilitate that type of dialogue. I think a lot more needs to be done. Right. Like and, what new things did they do, for example? Well, um, they've um, made improvements in, the security, um, they made improvement in terms of um, accommodations for us within the uh, hotel. Like uh, what? One of the things that they've done is they've opened up their penthouse suite, which contains um, conference rooms and stuff like that. So they created an entire schedule Monday through Sunday um, that um, has programming, uh, movie nights, uh, game nights. Um, we've um, had, we've secured um, participation from the uh, the outpatient um, apparatus that's within Project Renewal uh, called the Recovery Center. So they started coming maybe three weeks ago, uh, providing uh, harm reduction groups on Wednesdays and Saturdays. When you have a harm, I'm sorry for interrupting, but when you have a harm reduction group, is this uh, is that a talk? People talk about this. It's a psychological approach. Well, it's a it's a therapeutic group, but it's oh. it's done in a way where um, it welcomes anybody. You know, so all uh, uh, all of the shelter residents are welcome to attend. Um, at everybody's at different levels of recovery, and um, so it doesn't matter at what stage of recovery you at. It's open to everybody, and yeah, there's um, an open discussion. You know, people have a lot of things on their mind. It's a lot of times what happens is, you know, they're not able to express that, you know. And so this gives them the opportunity to do that. But there are also things that are done, um, like 
games that have a therapeutic approach. So there's fun activities that we all can find ways to bond and find ways to network and just release um, tension in a positive way. Um, so th that's been really good, you know. And what I really enjoy about it is that not just those that are in recovery have, have attended these. In most cases, it's those that are not in recovery who outnumber the ones that are in recovery. Which, Interesting. Yeah, which makes it a, a great um, uh, program at the at the at, at the Lucerne. You know, it, and most people, you know, I've come out and I've um, literally reached out to people that may be out in the neighborhood and say, "Hey, come on, you know, we got the group upstairs," and they come upstairs, and you know, you know, you wouldn't know if they're uh, under the influence of anything. They come and they join and they just, they have the greatest time. And it increases every week. There's always refreshments, so that's a good thing as well. And I've seen you motivate people and bond with people. So uh, uh, how did you become the homeless hero and what do you do? Well, <laughs> beyond being, you know, taking well, care of yourself. Well, like I said. Which is an important job. Yes, yeah. well, like I said, I'm, I'm like everybody else. I'm a resident, you know, and, um, you know, I've had my struggles with alcohol, and, and so personally, you know, I'm in recovery. I attend the, the, uh, the recovery center. Um, I, I get mental health treatment because a lot of times, you know, they're, especially during COVID, a lot of us are dealing with trauma. A lot of deal, us are dealing with stress. A lot of us are dealing with depression. And just the fact of being homeless can do something to your mental. So. You know, I benefit from the uh, treatment that I'm getting under Project Renewal through their um, recovery center and through um, their um, mental health provider, you know, my psychiatrist. Uh, the reason I became the homeless hero, I guess, before we even moved into the hotels, uh, what I saw uh, just being uh, in the shelter, uh, there were just things that I saw that might not be conducive to uh, my growth and development, um, trying to get from homelessness to housing. And so I started by advocating for myself, but I noticed that the more I advocated, other people would come to me, residents, and ask me to speak for them, ask me to do things like, could you do a petition, or could you... Um, go speak to the director about this issue or that issue or show me how to do this and show me how to do that. So it just was like, you know what? Let me not make this about me because there's so many other good people that's going through the same thing, but they just don't know where to go to, who to talk to, or maybe how to articulate themselves so that the message is heard the way it needs to be heard. And, and so I'm morphed into that. I do have a lot of support from the recovery center. Um, there we produce a newsletter and I've found an outlet to be able to write and to articulate my message through there. Um, so that's been a good thing. And, and the other people that contribute to it, you know, we kind of all feed off of each other. So a lot of times just sitting in a group, I'll get inspired by the experience of other people that are in the group. And from that experience, it'll give me um, the ideas of what to address. So that's another reason why it's the homeless hero and not me as an individual because you know, so, so many of our stories can be related. You know, we can relate to it. And so when I'm talking, when I'm talking, I'm not really just talking for myself. I may be talking for somebody else, you know. And if it's, if it's the, the objective is always to be proactive in the conversation, not reactive, not angry, and not uh, negative. You know, I'm looking for ways to create better uh to looking for ways to create solutions for whatever I may see as a problem and only to make things better, you know. That's, that's so great. Uh, I do have a, a few questions because the community is divided. Some people are all for the homeless and I think everybody would be if they weren't so afraid because we've been seeing crime on the streets go up and drug use. Uh, and it's not necessarily just from the Lucerne, you know, there's a lot of homeless people all over the place now. Um, so, do you know why we see police cars and ambulances in front of the Lucerne every day almost? Do you know what's going on? Do you witness what's going on? And, um, are there fights in the hallways or? 
Well, for the most Why? part, a lot of what you're hearing and, and even maybe seeing to a certain extent is um, hysteria that's really created by the media. Um, there are legitimate concerns and there, of course, you know, people in the community are alarmed that, you know, you have 283 people that we would describe as being um, in recovery, suffering from substance use disorder and mental illness. To say that you're just going to put 283 of them into somebody's community is going to alarm anybody, um, especially without a conversation. So that right there is what probably the main issue was, was that nobody really was forewarned of this. And so by not allowing the community to have a say in it, it, it angered a lot of people. And then to actually see something that's different from what you're normally seeing, and with this image being projected that there are people in, uh, in, uh, suffering from addiction, et cetera, you're, auto you're automatically pre predispositioned to look at the negative and not see a positive. And uh, that's understandable. I, I understand that side of things. Um, I also understand the side from my perspective that everybody is not um, um, out here exhibiting that behavior. Out of two, you don't literally see 283 people in the street. There are people that are leaving every day going to work. There are people that have no substance use or mental health issues. I, I talk to people who've been divorced, who work great jobs, but because of a divorce, they now don't have the house. They're, they're now supporting, paying alimony and child support, and it's a little difficult for them. But these are working people like everybody else. And then there's, um, there are people that are struggling. Um, so there were mistakes made, I believe, in the beginning. There should have been a conversation. This should have been worked out. Supportive services should have been put in place. Maybe even services and, and, and um, programs that the community can offer. You know, all of this thing could have been worked out beforehand and made the uh, conversation, uh, uh, made it easier for the community to, to, to digest. There was such a negative effect on us, the residents, when you see uh, your fellow residents uh, be, and it didn't even matter because they just grouped all 283 of us as being a part of whatever negative behavior you saw. And that's traumatizing for a lot of us. So many people have come to me and said, you know, like they're traumatized. They're, they, you know, they're, these things have triggered people, you know, in a negative way because they're seeing the news outside or whatever the case is. So when you, some of these things that you see, um, because this is new, this environment is new, even the staff, security, um, didn't know to expect certain things. And so when it happened, it was like they had to jump on it. One thing I will say is that I'm, I kind of welcome the community pressure because it forces people to be accountable. It forces people to think maybe we did something wrong and to figure out what do we need to do right. Now the conversation could be had. Now they could say we want to create a safer environment, not just inside, but also outside. Now we have to think more about how whatever we do dealing with the homeless will affect the communities that they have to inhabit. And so maybe if the community didn't say anything, it, it would be a lot worse. So now, you know, you do have beef up security. You know, I talked to the head of security for Project Renewal, and any complaint that is brought to him, from my point of view, and I've talked to him in, uh, on many occasions, he jumps right on. He does whatever he has to do to navigate that. There's some things that are beyond his control, but he has a relationship with the 20th precinct, and they've taken care of that. Yeah. So unfortunately, we have to wrap up because it's going on YouTube. It's 15 minutes. Is there anything in closing you want to say? Anything that can be changed, that can be improved in the shelter? Well, the food, uh, for example, is very bad. <laughs> oh, they definitely, that's the number one complaint from residents. We definitely got to work on the food part. You know, that's, that's, that's everybody's number one complaint. But just, you know, I, my thing to the community is give us some time. Keep articulating yourselves. And, and, you know, at the end of the day, on all levels, we just need a seat at the table. Listen to us, um, and I'm talking more to the officials. Give us a seat at the table. 
Well, thank you so much, homeless hero. You are a hero. No problem.